So now I'm going to switch to probably my, my favorite type of dementia, which is frontal temporal dementia. And unfortunately, if you went around town and you asked doctors that they know what frontal temporal dementia is, some have never even heard of it. And I'm going to talk about them as a class, um, rather than talking about individuals. But if we understand what the frontal brain does, um, you understand what frontal temporal dementia is. And so rather than going through all this information, I'm just going to talk about Phineas Gage. And Phineas Gage was a guy who worked on the railroads in the 1800s. And his job was, they used to put, um, they used to have the railroad spike and they used to put a little bit of dynamite on it. And then they would hit it. And then they would drive it down on the ground and that's how they would lay the tracks across, you know, America. And what happened to Phineas Gage is he did it and there was a big rock under there and the spike came up and it went through the front part of his brain. And he actually lived. And prior to this spike going through the front part of his brain, you know, the stories go, he was a God-fearing man, went to church, he was cordial, had a good personality. And then after he lost the front part of his brain, he was a womanizer, he was a drunk, he cursed. And that's when we learned what the front part of the brain was. And it basically is your moral center in a way. It's your inhibition. Um, you know, it tells you, don't do that. That's probably not a good thing to do. Um, and so when you have a dementia in your front part of your brain, you end up getting a lot of behavioral manifestations. And this is how you, you quickly get in trouble um, if you start having issues with behavior because it could end up in the, the court system. The striking thing is if you see that the mean age is 52.8 and a, you know, 52 .8 years, so it's much, much, much younger than Alzheimer's. When I showed you the prevalence of Alzheimer's, it goes up and up and up and up as we age. Here we're talking in the 50s. And so it tends to be you know, younger people. They talk, one study showed 14 to 3, so for every 14 men who has it, three females, another study shows that men and females were equal. I will tell you, I see it all the time in males. Um, you know, once or twice a year I see it in females. So in my practice it's much more complex, uh, uh, common in, in, in males. And so basically it's a younger person's dementia and a lot of times people, they start to lose their friends because they have changes in their personalities. You know, there's some people who always say what's on their mind, but they've always said what's on their mind. This is something, you know, you, you would notice a change in somebody's personality. Um, so if you have a younger person, it's going to be the most common cause of uh, a dementia. And being a caregiver of somebody who has frontal temporal dementia is, is, is much harder than being a caregiver than Alzheimer's, if you could believe that, because all the behavioral uh, manifestations. And I, I think of a case probably about seven, eight years ago that was referred to me by the sheriff at the time. And it was somebody who's, who's led a pretty good life, never been in trouble with the law, and somebody was scantily dressed at Walmart, and he reached out and grabbed a handful. And, you know, there may have been 10 men walking by this woman who said, who noticed, but the front of the brain said, you can't touch. This guy's front of the brain didn't say that. And so should somebody like this, are they a criminal? And, you know, some of them may be, but most of them end up having uh, frontal temporal dementias. And this guy, once we started treating him, put in a little bit of support network, never got in any trouble, you know, again. Um, and, and that's the things that brings it to their attention. It's not the memory difficulties, because their memory is pretty good. It's the behavioral problems that get them in, in, into trouble. Um, and being a caregiver, uh, for somebody who has that is very difficult because you're always going around p apologizing. Um, and some of it, you may be the brunt of it. Um, we have somebody we take care of now um, who we've just realized having all male caregivers was the way to go. <laughs> and try to find all male caregivers in Naples. <laughs> it's a, you know, it takes a long time, but the behavioral manifestations, you, they were just so difficult. And we can use medications to help with the behaviors if behavioral therapy doesn't work. And a lot of times it's the mood stabilizes. Um, as far as treating the frontal temporal dementias, you know, it, it's very controversial. Some people will give them cholinesterase inhibitors like Aricept, um, Exelon, um, 
And then some people actually think it does more harm than good. Um, unfortunately, families want to do something, so more, than, more often than not, you end up giving something. But if it helps, it doesn't help for, for, for very, uh, doesn't do very much. It's very insidious, so the behavioral issues start off very slow at first, and then it just starts to get worse and worse. And so you see problems with their social skills, their friends start to leave them, um, they have poor insight into things, you know, they didn't realize that grabbing those boobs was wrong, you know, because the front part of the brain is not telling them it's wrong. And then they get a very emotional blunting where their affect, you know, most of us, our moods go up and down, up and down, up and down. They're pretty stable throughout the day and they become tough people to read because you, there's no real facial expressions with regard to, um, you know, what's going on. They also have problems with hygiene. Um, so, you know, they tend to become disheveled. You know, they don't pr tend to brush their teeth. They're not combing their hair. And this is all part of the, the, the front part of the brain. The other thing is they become very rigid and inflexible. And so you, now you have somebody who's making bad decisions and they're rigid about the bad decisions. And that becomes very difficult because you try to talk them out of it and it just becomes a bad situation. Somebody who has Alzheimer's disease, you distract them and then five minutes later they forgot about them. Their memory is not that bad. So they don't forget about it. And, 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 but it becomes difficult because they don't have the same understanding um, and they get very uh, perseverative behavior. They do things over and over again. And they also develop problems with speech and language. And there's one type of frontal temporal dementia that you know, I see about every three or four years down here, which is called primary progressive aphasia. And it's, very, uh, it's a hard disease because it, 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 it's really hitting younger people. And they lose the ability to basically talk. And it starts off with um, some language issues and we have a case that I've been taking care of for probably about four years of a guy who was up north and he got confused when he was driving and so he just left his car in the middle of a lane and walked to a gas station, you know, and then his mom brought him down here and, you know, you got to bless her mom, you know, he, she loves him like no tomorrow, but it was very difficult because she kept on making excuses, you know, well, you know, it's a, well, he just, he, even though it's a pen, he always called it a pencil. And the excuses go on and on, and as time goes on, the language gets very, gets worse and worse and worse to the point that they can't communicate. Um, and this one was taken by a caregiver to a play, and he, he took somebody else's purse, you know, and then the sheriffs got involved, and you know, it just, you gotta be very careful. They have to be, you know, supervised, because they can't explain to the people what's going on. They can't even say who it is. And this one in particular I had sent to a, a local neurologist who did a PET scan and, and Medicare will pay for a PET scan if you're trying to tell the difference between Alzheimer's and frontal temporal dementia. And I'll tell you, you should be able to tell the difference between Alzheimer's and frontal temporal dementia and you don't need a PET scan. But anyway, they got a PET scan and, and it was suggestive of Alzheimer's disease even though there was no way this patient had Alzheimer's disease. And so even seeing a good neurologist in town, he was misdiagnosed because he put so much emphasis on, this tet, on the PET scan rather than the clinical history. You fast forward three years and he can barely talk now. And their cognition tends to be, you know, okay. They do have memory difficulty, but they get all the other frontal temporal things. They get the, the hygiene and everything else that you, you, you struggle with. And, 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 and so when I talk about frontal temporal dementia, I talk about it as a whole, but there's Pick's disease, there's, there's a lot of them that get involved with, with regard to this. And so the, the key to diagnosing it really is taking a good history. The history will tell you based on the behaviors, but you could do neuropsych testing and they have problems with something called a trail making test, which is a, a, a front part of the brain. And there's two type of trail making tests, there's a trail making A and B. And the A is, is a full sheet of paper and it has circles and they're numbered one, two, three. And what you have to do is you have to connect a, a line from one to two to three to four to five. And, and you know, they have difficulty with doing that. And trail making B, you have to go from one to A to two to B. And when I talked about how they're rigid, we're trying to shift them from a number to a letter and they have a hard time with that. 
well, somebody with Alzheimer's, you know, does better on that. And so you could get it from the history, you could get it from the neuropsych testing. And then when you do imaging studies, you see marked atrophy. And so this is the, this is the nose, this is the back of the brain, here's where the eyes are. And you can see this is a normal brain, and you can see how it's just, it's just atrophy, there's just space there. And you know, that's where the brain is supposed to be. And that's what you start to see in a, in a, in a frontal temporal um, uh, dementia. Interesting on this is that there's a little bit of an old stroke on this uh, uh, scan as, as well. Um, you know, which is, this is different than, than, than an Alzheimer's disease where the whole brain is, is shrinking, but a lot of it is in the hippocampal region. This is primarily up in the front of the brain. And if you do a PET scan, PET scan is, um, all it does is measure glucose metabolism. And so active cells do glucose. So somebody who has lung cancer gets a PET scan because that tumor is going quicker than all the other cells and it lights up. Same thing in the brain. So if you're using your brain, it lights up and you could see, this is the, the cerebellum back of the brain, front of the brain, and you could see red is very active. And you could see there's, there's nothing going on up there. And this would be a classic example of somebody who's having frontal temporal dementia. It's not always this clear cut, um, um, but, but I would argue you don't need any of these images in studies to diagnose it. You know, all you need to do is, is talk to the patient and the family and most of the time you, you'll be able to figure it out. Um, so the pathology of it is basically this atrophy we see. There's no, you don't look under the microscope and see something particular. It's not like an Alzheimer's where you have plaques and tangles. We just see atrophy. Why the cells are dying, you know, we, we, we don't know. We have some ideas and you could see some pix bodies and you could see some taus, but it's a mixed smorgasbord and there's nothing really that defines the disease based on the pathology. Um, and again, th the reason why you want to diagnose somebody with frontal temporal dementia is, is because you really need to plan for the future. It's a much harder illness to, to deal with and these people really end up a, a lot of times in assisted livings. They do much better at home, um, but a lot of times the caregivers just can't keep up with them, so they end up um, in an assisted living. The reason why they don't do well in assisted living is picture somebody who's disinhibited in a place where other people have memory difficulty. And somebody who has Alzheimer's sees a cookie and thinks it's their cookie and grabs it. And the front of the brain is supposed to say, don't hit that person. And when you have frontal temporal dementia, they hit them. And it's hard because most of these people who are getting this are males. And now you put them in a unit that's a lot of older females. And so in Boston, we used to actually have different units. And we'd have units where the, you put the big men together. Um, because if they got into a fight with somebody, you know, at least some, you know, it's, it's almost equal. <laughs> Versus, you know, down here where we just don't have enough of it to have specialized units for that. Um, and then obviously the legal aspects of it, um, being involved with the, the, the sheriff, and I volunteer with the sheriff's office, they'll send me cases to, to try to see if the person's a, a criminal or not. Um, and it'd be nice if they gave me their old police record, but they won't. And, and so sometimes it's hard to figure out, sometimes it's obvious, um, but they can get in trouble with the law. And again, if it's an illness, it's an illness, and they shouldn't be you know, in prison for that.